about um, this idea of uh, basic income or an unconditional basic income from uh, both an anti-capitalist perspective but also an, an anti-statist perspective. And that's why I call it a pluriversal basic income because it's uh, the idea of giving everybody an unconditional amount of money to live um, but uh, without the borders of the nation state or out, outside uh, or beyond them, really. But it's, it's also a, an attempt at uh, trying to rethink and re or transform what money is and how we conceive money and how we use it. Because uh, as I argue, uh, money is nothing but a set of promises that we make to one another. It is a, a sort of an IOU. Uh, you know, so yeah, um, today's talk is a bit about how do we go about uh, challenging really one of the core uh, elements of the system, but also, but also a taboo really in, in, in like society in general and specifically also uh, in, in the left uh, or whatever is left of the left. Um, um, like topics of money are often, the, yeah, uh, relegated to a domain of just saying, oh, you know, that money is evil, so we should just not talk about it or we shouldn't do anything about it. It's just bad and we have to deal with it. But at the end of the day, it is a, it, it, the reality of, of wage labor, of the, the fact that we need to work for money in order to survive uh, is still there. And it's also like, uh, it's really a, a colonizing principle in the sense that you have to rent yourself, you have to rent your work, your body, uh, to somebody in order to get uh, a couple of tokens of value of paper or or even uh, digital money nowadays uh, so you can pay for the bread that you live on. Yeah. And so the idea of basic income is this really uh, emancipatory proposal of saying, what if everybody had uh, enough money to live? What if everybody had a, a basic amount of money that uh, they could choose what to do with? Uh, so without a bureaucrat telling them what to do, about it or to prove to them that they're, you know, uh, X, Y, or Z, if they're, uh, you know, a specific gender or a specific class uh, of income uh, and so on and so forth. So um, the, the proposal of a basic income uh, is quite a, po a potent one, and especially nowadays that we're living in, in this uh, uh, in these times of crisis, economic crisis, affective crisis, health crisis, uh, people in the streets are lacking uh, more and more cash, like the, the, because of lack of economic activity, many businesses are closing down. Governments in some countries, the more, more richer ones, of course, are giving some aid, some 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 handouts to the to, to people. Uh, but in many parts of the world, this is impossible. So people have to figure out what to do uh, in order to keep things running. You know, the solidarity, you know, create circuits of solidarity uh, or ways in which to keep well circulating, right? So. Um, so again, just to, for the sake of uh, definition, uh, a basic income is usually defined by the by the Earth Network uh, of basic income as the unconditional amount of of money or an unconditional cash transfer that is given to all or all individuals or all people in a given uh, political community. Um, so it's not given to uh, the head of the household or or to the mother, but it's given to also the children. The mother, the father, and everybody in society, basically. Um, then there's also the question of um, the 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 way in which that money will come about. Um, oftentimes, this is one of the big questions that people always, you know, uh, debate to you uh, about basic income. Is like, but where will the money come from? Uh, this question, where will the money come from, is a really, really interesting question in general because it really challenges us the notions of, of what money is and where actually it comes from. Um, so today, as uh, most of you may know already, money is actually uh, produced by banks, mostly private banks, but also, of course, uh, state money, uh, central banks, when they give you a loan or when they issue a, a debt to you. So from the perspective of banks, uh, they issue money outwards, um, as a debt, and then you get it as a as a as a as, as 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 something that then you have to pay back eventually, right? So the the way it works is in like some sort of expansionary way, where like the central government 
when the central bank gives money, uh, issues money into being uh, with a specific uh, interest rate that has to be paid back at, uh, to banks, to private banks, which then, then issue credit to businesses, to people, to institutions, in order to, to make the economy run, as they say, right? So uh, the whole even notion of, of, of things that we take for granted, like economic growth, GDP, uh, gross domestic product, all these concepts uh, are actually rooted in money. Uh, so like the way that we think nations uh, today, or we imagine them to, to sort of grow their economic output is really just by looking at the, the change in the interest rate year per year uh, that, they, that the money had a return over. So when the central bank says we want to grow by 3%, uh, that's basically the rate at which uh, countries more or less grow. So it's really uh, a statistical fiction that has real, uh, real ecological and, and economic consequences on people because when money is issued at an interest, at a positive interest, as a form of debt, uh, with an interest, then um, you're basically saying that the resources of uh, of other people or more people will have to be used in order to pay back this debt. So when a bank gives somebody a loan, so let's say I give a loan to Paolo uh, and I tell him, hey, Paolo, here's 100,000, I'm, I'm a bank, I'm an evil bank, uh, and, and I tell him, you have to pay me 200,000 back. Um, where will that other 100,000 come from? It comes from other people's debt comes from other people's money. So you essentially have a system that is designed as a vacuum cleaner, as a, as a pyramid uh, for the purposes of extracting value from the from the central state that also taxes people, but also issues money into being and then taxes it away to then the private banks that put money in orbit, so to speak, as my friend uh, Brett Scott likes to call it. Uh, and, then, and then people basically have to uh, give it back. So the extraction of value happens uh, in all aspects of society, and then we're always crumbling about where to get money. Uh, so structurally, uh, we are always competing against each other, even if we don't want to, for a money that is made scarce. So yes, money is evil in the sense that it is produced by the nation state uh, institutions of today uh, and capitalism as a, uh, as a system, right? Uh, where, where this money lives some, some, somehow. Um, so... Okay, so having said that, um, where will the money for basic income come from? <laughs> I, so when, when most people, more serious people at least talk about proposals for making a basic income happen, uh, usually they point to this idea of a sovereign wealth fund. So what, what the hell is a sovereign wealth fund? A sovereign wealth fund is basically when a country, uh, say Norway, uh, finds a bunch of oil in their land. Oh my God, there's a bunch of oil. And then they say, okay, wait, we shouldn't just sell it we should make an industry and then uh, sell, sell this oil, but then we can also, from the proceeds of that, invest in other industries and then create uh, more investment and buy stocks in companies. And then that, that, the, the returns of that investment will go to people back as a basic income. So effectively today, Norway has a sovereign wealth fund, which would basically make all Norwegians a millionaire. De facto, everybody would get a million dollars if if the money of that fund would be distributed equally by the people of Norway. Uh, of course it's not, but, um, uh, but it's based on the logic of um, a, a capital investment. So I invest in an industry and then the dividends of that will not go to capitalists, but it will go to people, which is, which is it, it, like in today's terms where inequality is so horrible, it is a progressive proposal uh, if we're talking about the nation state. Uh, uh, logic as a whole, at least, uh, in the fact that, in the sense that it wants to redistribute uh, money from one uh, money that uh, is invested in some industry, in this case it was oil, uh, or whatever other investment uh, the bureaucrats want to invest on, and then give it to people. Now, there is another uh, way uh, in which people want to, or at least propose to fund a basic income, and it's basically through taxation. So it's basically this imagination of, like, let's take money from the rich and then give it to everybody in this, or the poor or in, with a basic income, with a universal basic income, it will be really to all society, right? So the net amount that people will be taxed will depend on the level of wealth. And then some people will actually get a net benefit out of that taxation. Uh, or some people will get a negative benefit if they're really rich, for example, because they already have 
a hundred a thousand times the basic income, right? Um, uh, so rich people, yes, effectively they already have many times the basic income. They do not uh, need one, but the idea of giving it to everybody is just a it's really a social ritual in a way of trying to equalize everybody to say that this is all a common pool. Uh, now the logic of taxation, uh, while you know nice in many ways, it 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 it's, it's also Kind of like a, it, it lacks a real critical understanding of actually what taxation even is and, and its role and purpose in society. Uh, so this leads me to the third way uh, uh, in which some proposals have come up, not so much uh, actually on how to actually finance the basic income, which is through this notion of sovereign money or this idea that uh, actually governments, as I was saying before, they issue money into being and then they take it away through various means like taxation. So taxation uh, is actually not a way of redistributing wealth, so to speak. It's more a, a mechanism to control and manage the money mechanisms, the money supply. So when a, a government issues money, they want to tax away so much so they can make sure that the amount of uh, you know uh, power basically that is distributed in the economy can remain uh, stable in some sort of way or directed in certain forms. So some people argue that um, governments want to balance out uh, the amounts of goods uh, and stuff that is circulating, the wealth that is circulating with the amount of money. Um, in practice, I would argue that capital is power. Uh, it is a form of organized power. And so um, when you look at financial markets going up, and you and you like draw also a line of the of, of wages. You can see the, the the this index of power being that the more financial markets go up, the more money they make. Uh, they make it from somewhere, and they make it usually from people's wages. So, the the, the lower the wages historically have been, the higher the financial markets have been, as is happening today uh, during the Corona crisis. So there is effectively a, a stealing of wealth, if you may, by this process of uh, monetary creation, either by central governments or private banks. But just back to my point, um, this idea of sovereign money would mean that a government could issue money into being as a basic income without a debt, without a positive interest on it, uh, with a zero, zero interest or even negative, if you want to be really radical, um, um, and then tax it away as, 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 they, as they see fit. Now, this proposal is actually uh, underpinned by a theory called MMT or Modern Monetary Theory, which is used nowadays in the discourse of the, of the left, the political left, mostly in the US. There are also elements of that in Europe, uh, where the Green New Deal is sort of proposed as this mechanism whereby we will invest in jobs, in green jobs, in green industries, and all of that will be done through this mechanism of, 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 of monetary creation, sovereign money, uh, or MMT, right? Uh, they're made into some sort of straw man by both the left and the right wing, the people that do MMT, but actually their understanding of money is actually quite accurate from a historical and anthropological point of view because it follows from the logic, which is an ancient logic that states have done for thousands of years, which is, we call it the anthropologists, we call it the military coinage slavery complex. So it's basically a king hiring an army uh, in order to go and slave a population. Uh, are citizens by today's terms, um, uh, and then tax them with the coin uh, of their making uh, for having been slaved. So basically the process of monetary creation and monetary destruction is really just a way in which a sovereign encapsulates the territory, makes it their own, uh, and then starts like, yeah, basically colonizing people's surplus value and their labor by the means of violence and taxation, so by paying their bureaucrats with weapons and also no weapons uh, to do that, right? So the whole government apparatus works in this way, in this military coinage slavery complex. And this, this logic still goes until today, and the modern monetary people know this. Uh, like, they know that money is underpinned by violence. Uh, regardless if you want to make a Green New Deal or whatever, it's still underpinned by this imperialist machine uh, that today is the military uh, slavery uh, industrial complex, or um, so. Yeah, um, 
so yeah, so 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 to me, when I when I came to this idea of uh, thinking about basic income, I was thinking, okay, how can we make a basic income happen right now? How can we uh, claim the right to do a basic income by sort of hacking money, by hacking the way that it is made, uh, and also yeah, what we can do with it somehow. So. Um, by taking this principle of monetary creation, uh, like you could, you, you you have also a history of, of of complementary currencies, community currencies, alternative currencies that are that have tried to not do a basic income, but to give people in local communities, especially in times of crisis, a means in which they can exchange the resources. So communities come together and they say we want to like uh, manage our risk together, so we're going to do a community credit to then exchange uh, positive and negative credits with each other according to you know what we what we give to one another. So I can give this mask to Paolo, for example, for, I don't know, 20, 20, uh, 20 pots, and then he can then use those 20 pots to buy food at the store because the store owner accepts this. He's part of the community and he accepts this, right? Uh, these sort of systems have existed also for thousands of years as the democratic tradition that our, our friend from the Kurdish uh, movement or the internationalist movement uh, in Kurdistan was talking about, uh, they're normally referred to as mutual credit. Um, mutual credit actually has this very interesting history uh, with even the likes of Proudhon, uh, this French anarchist, um, giving proposals uh, as, as a way of sort of reforming money in his time during the Paris Commune and so on, um, as a way of saying, let's, let's deal away with the state uh, by just issuing a social credit or social money system, social mutual credit money system, which actually today has become a, a Chinese dystopia, right? Everybody has heard of the social credit systems in China and how they will be used to survey people even more. Now, this doesn't mean that the systems have to be used by state mechanisms. They can also be used by people democratically in order to actually create something like a currency for the commons. And so, uh, this leads me to this idea of, of a non-state basic income or a, or a basic income beyond the nation state, a pluriverse uh, of different social relations, of different forms of organizing autonomy, autonomous zones, federated in many ways into some sort of democratic confederalism, as our friend was uh, talking about here, or in many different forms. Like it could be, you know, cyber, cyber feminist monies or autonomous monies, but the point of it is to actually claim the wealth. So this is, a, uh, in, in practice right now, I, we started a project uh, in October called Circles UPI, which is basically trying to do just that, uh, basically issuing money to people who join the system uh, unconditionally every day. And then the, the, the actual work is about, okay, what can I do with this, right? Um, so initially it's, it's interesting right? because we want it to be a basic income, but it's more like basic pocket money. So when people join, there are a couple of things you can do with it, and then people spend it at the, the Shpeti here, the local shop, for a coffee or for whatever it can be sourced uh, from within the network, right? But more than more than uh, more than the money itself, this is a tool that people can use to then actually claim wealth or common communalize or make a commons of wealth in their area. So then people can say, "Hey, we want to use this to pay our rent or to even like you know." take over territories, like actually use it as a way of using it in specific uh, pieces of land, uh, buy food with it, support the local agriculture, so we can then use this for the raw materials and also basically to relocalize and re regionalize the economy from the bottom up. So the idea of, of this sort of pluriversal basic income is really to make money a commons or a money commons or a credit commons, if, however you want to call it. But basically, this idea of the money commons is, is, is to say, what if we just took away the private property in money itself and just use it as what it is, which is a promise, a promise to pay uh, for something that you need. Uh, uh, and in practice, if we actually were to do that and we were actually say, hey, let's give to each other the things that we need to live in this life, uh, it would mean that <laughs> you could have effectively a uh, radically democratic way in which people can claim wealth from uh, places uh, and then bring it into this uh, sort of commons as a way of, of living and then managing it together. Uh, so it's really a way of challenging this sort of uh, top-down monetary state infrastructure systems 
and use the principles of direct democracy and, and yeah, and democratization uh, as a way of achieving um, this, this bottom-up basic income or, or, or really economic democracy, because what it is is really connecting uh, producers and distributors and coordinating between them in a way where people are no longer alienated for, from the means of production, but actually can uh, connect with the local people in their areas and see who, who is doing what, who is producing what, and everybody can take part in this in a democratic, cooperative way. Um, so the idea of, of the money commons is basically uh, underneath it is really a, an ethos and a, a, an idea of care or an ecology of trying to build an ecology of caring relations where we are actually caring for each other around us, making sure that nobody, you know, everybody has this basic livelihood in order to uh, meet their basic needs, but also um, taking care of the relations with the earth, right? So it's, it's local, local economies, the building of local economies. Um, that is more territorialized and that can then also be federated because of course not all communities can produce everything right we live in a deeply deeply interdependent uh, web of life and we need money systems that can uh, reflect that so with circles it's a first attempt it's a first experiment at trying to challenge the political imagination uh, of what is possible by adding a, a, a territory of defense as we were saying before uh, with the cyber girls, not just the body territory, the land territory, but also the money territory. So to think of money as a territory of defense uh, and to really claim uh, power, uh, because capital is power, but give it to the people and say that we can create a, a people-powered money uh, that is not uh, backed by the violence of the state or, 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 or private banks, um, but by the relationships uh, that are built between people in in, in different forms and ways, and that they, and they can be contested democratically. Also, uh, to democratize money itself would mean uh, and and a beginning of an end of capitalism. I would argue, because it would mean that people could decide where and how uh, is money issued and for what purposes. So, if somebody is doing some asshole thing down the line, that could be stopped because the money as a territory. Uh, the people say, no, we don't want that. It doesn't flow with our values. So it's really about allowing people to create other monies with other values that escape the cosmology of capitalism uh, or break with the cosmology of capitalism and actually allow the diversity and interdependence of the planet to flourish. Um, I think I will end here. Uh, yeah. Julio, can I ask a question? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for, for that talk, because I, <laughs> I, 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 I have a hard time getting my head around economy. Yeah. And lately I've been thinking a lot about the uh, livelihood factor. Yeah. You know, and like yeah. I'm living in a city that basically I'm, I'm forced in the regime of this capitalist Euro currency, dollar currency, whichever yeah. currency is, is yeah. of the nation states that are, yeah. you know, uh, able to maintain their regime of, mm. of this, this, this currency that functions for a lot of things. Like, so I'm excited about the, the, the UBI circles experiment. But then I'm, I'm, I'm imagining that it's so hard to escape the regime yeah. that I'm in. You know, I, I mm. do have to pay... A landlord, for yeah. example, for yeah. and it's like a time factor almost that, mm -hmm. that dominates. Like I know I have to put so much time into trying to make some yeah. some hard currency for this uh, mm -hmm. paying the my my, my rent my rent master. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, somehow I'm wondering. Okay, there was this example of uh, Dine Ringelman was the the founder after it was before Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. And her concept around, you know, doing fundraising online now that everybody was so connected online, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, I want to try to democratize capital, was her phrase. Okay. And so, like, okay. I have a project, and I'm going to ask uh, $5,000 uh, to make my next music album. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of people, this, there was a period where this was really working, and, mm -hmm. and people, you get enough of your fans, you get people to, to, 
to pitch in and you raise, you'd raise that money and then you, you could go to work without having to, you know, go find a label to sponsor you and give yeah. you that capital. Yeah. You could make it DIY. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm wondering with the, with the UBI, if there's some kind of, or the, the you know, the alternative currency mm -hmm. in, in some kind of, you know, subversive dance with, uh, with the, re, you know, the economy regime that we're forced to play. Mm -hmm. Um, if there could be some kind of interplay with these economies, you know, like I, yeah. oh, I have, I have a lot of circles this month. I haven't used for the, you know, mm -hmm. food, AT or whatever, mm -hmm. but I have a friend who is in trouble paying her rent mm -hmm. and I, you know, somehow, I don't, I don't have it fleshed out, but mm -hmm. like, can I somehow subsidize this person for that month to help her out or you get mm. a group, the community say, yeah, yeah. Oh, we will help you in that other currency yeah, yeah, yeah. until you can pay back the community of circles. Yeah, that is, I mean, that's the thing.